morning, everyone, and welcome to church. It's such a beautiful Sunday. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you, Tim, for giving me voice. <laughs> Although my voice doesn't usually need a mic anyhow. But anyhow, once again, welcome to our Sunday service. So glad that you're here. We're going to start with our opening chant, God is all there is. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So nice to see those of you who are here in person, and welcome as well to those of you who have joined us via Facebook Live and Zoom. So welcome to our 9.45 a.m. service here at the North Hollywood Church of Religious Science, where we are now going to move into prayer. However, before we do, I don't want to forget, now that we're gathered in person, I know we're so used to just doing whatever we want. If you have something might, that might buzz or make noise during the service, if you just make sure that is silenced uh, right now, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. And now that we've taken care of that, let's join together in prayer. Just closing our eyes turning our attention inward and just allowing ourselves to sense beyond our physical senses, beyond the sense of you, me, him, her, this, that, here and there, and to feel that vibration in which we are all interconnected, that vibration of God's love out of which everything is created and that lives and moves and expresses itself throughout creation. I absolutely know that God's love is unfolding throughout our time together, that it is that love of the divine that allows us to feel that connection that we share as a community gathered together and virtually. I know it is that love of God that inspires and flows through each and every one of those individuals who's of service today, here in the sanctuary and in our youth church. I notice God's artistry, beauty, and inspiration that flows through our musicians, Sam and Bob, and through our soloist, Nita Whitaker, this morning. I know we're touched and uplifted by the music. And I especially know that we are awakened to that divine essence of our being through the absolutely perfect message that flows through and is delivered by our beloved Reverend Sidney. I know that Reverend Sidney is that vessel through which the divine speaks to our hearts and that we leave here with a greater 
awareness of that goodness of God at the center of our being so we can experience it more fully in our lives. And so I give thanks right in this moment for all the blessings that I know we receive throughout our service. And in gratitude, I release this word knowing it's absolutely done in the mind of God, and so it is. And together we say, Amen. Please rise and join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so please remain standing for our congregational song, which will be coming up. <laughs> but we can start swaying. <laughs> All right, here we, we're going to try it now. Already. <laughs> God is the love that I am. God is the love that I am. God is the love that I am. And so it is. God is the joy that I am. God is the joy that I am. God is the joy that I am.
so it is. Where I go, I always know that God's forever on my side. As I grow, I'm in the flow. I only need it to decide that God is the love that I Please be seated. Ha, ah, okay. I almost felt like I should be doing the pony. <laughs> okay, so now we get to give ourselves the gift of just getting still. Turning within, and for the next five minutes, we're gonna commune with that presence that lies within us. And so I invite you for the next five minutes to just silently repeat the phrase, God is the love that I am, that we were just singing together. God is the love that I am. Just silently repeat that mantra over and over, and I'll bring us out of meditation in five minutes.
as I lay me down, heaven hear me now, I'm lost without a cause, after giving it my all, winter storms have come, darkened my sun, after all that I've been on earth can I turn to? I look to you. I look to you. And when all my strength is gone, in you I can be strong. I look to you. I look to you. About to lose my breath, no more fighting left, sinking to rise no more, searching for that open door, and every road I'm taking leads to my regret, I don't know if I'm gonna make it, nothing to do but leave. shoes by the way it's all about the shoes and I have shoe envy because a lot of my stuff is still in storage since we're in the process of moving and so I want what size do you wear never mind good morning, good morning. I am Reverend Dr. Sidney Steen and I am so happy to be here as your new assistant minister And I know Bob, because we used to gig together. That's right. <laughs> Back a million years ago when we were that tall, right? Yep. yep. Anyway, all right. There is something radically right with you. Do you know that? 
Did y'all grow up being raised by someone who said, baby, there's something radically right with you? <laughs> if they didn't do that, they did it wrong. And this is, well, they did the best they could. But this is what I want you to know. There is something radically right with you. There is something radically right with everybody and with me. Even today, as I stood in front of the mirror and went, man, I need to lose 15 pounds by 10 o'clock. How am I going to do this? <laughs> We chant, God is the love that I am, and I'm sort of going, God is the muffins I am. <laughs> anyway, so I am so glad to be back in California. I grew up here, I was born and raised here, and we left 17 years ago when our son was just, I, I guess he was about four years old, and I have to figure out that math, maybe not five, because he's 22 now. Um, and we, we moved to Oregon. We moved to the woods of Newburgh, Oregon, where we had coyotes and cougars and deer and, and I mean it was just lovely and wonderful and now we're back and I'm so glad I feel I haven't been out in the desert for 40 years but I feel as if I have come back home because this is the church where I got licensed as a practitioner and I first started I mean I grew up in religious science from the time I was about eight years old but this church is my home because when I first started coming here in, oh my gosh, it might have been 1994, 95. Um, in my practitioner training, Reverend Mark wasn't even a minister yet. He was my, one of our teaching assistants. And we had so much fun. This church is just an amazing, wonderful place. And so as I've been back here, as Charlie, my husband, and you'll meet him, I'm sure, as we've been back here, we've been exploring the world around us, checking out the neighborhoods and everything to see all the changes and to see how life's expression has changed. And a lot of it is the same, but I have to tell you, I was driving, there are a couple of things I saw on Friday that kind of blew my mind. One of them was as, I'm, as I was driving on Magnolia, I went past a building and it had a big sign and said, Republic of Pi. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> okay, now I don't know anything about the Republic of Pi. I don't know their form of government, I don't know their national holidays, and I don't know their total, total population. I'm pretty sure they don't have a standing army, but I gotta say, if anybody deserves to have a standing army to protect their assets and their resources, it's a place called the Republic of Pi. So I, I'm really grateful to live in a country that has a Republic of Pi. So the other thing that struck me was that Charlie and I were driving to the coast Friday afternoon. We thought we'd get some some nice cool sea air and take the dog to the beach. And, uh, and I've always loved that drive. As we came around that last curve on um, Los Virgenes where you suddenly see the entire ocean in front of you. It's just so breathtaking. And I thought that was the miracle. But as we kept going and drove past Pepperdine University, as far as we could see, flags, American flags. Now, I'm, I'm not a get up and march kind of xenophobic person. I, I, although I did spend time in the Air Force and, I, and I, I stand for the values that we stand for, freedom, expression, and access, and social justice. But that took my breath away. And a lot of you probably already know what that was about. Um, it's a tradition that happens every year at Pepperdine Hurley. I had to Google it. And it's, they have a memorial celebration to honor the almost 3,000 lives that were lost on 9-11. Um, there were also flags representing the countries of people who lost their lives who were not necessarily American citizens. And it's really a spectacular tribute to see this, this, this site. I mean, the specter is pretty amazing. Um, so, I know that there have been a lot of memorials and a lot of tributes, and we've all seen the footage over and over and over again. And what I'd like to do today is offer all of us a path forward which doesn't just honor that event, but which will help create us, help, help create within us a greater context of hope, of possibility, and spiritual understanding, and a sense of what do we do now? Where do we go now? My talk titled started off as something entirely different. Um, it was, now what? Or, what now? Because I think so many of us go through life going, now what? 
instead of going, what now, God? What's next? What, what can I do now? So many years ago, Ernest Holmes, who founded this teaching, wrote about the importance of remembering your divinity, remembering that there's something radically right about you. He wanted all of us to remember that power that we have within us, that, that we get to choose to know ourselves as divine or not. So he wrote this, and I think it's really, really key. When ideas of evil, lack, or fear present themselves, exercise your dominion over them. Realize that your faith is the law of elimination to evil. There is no spiritual law of discord, sickness, or lack. The laws of spirit are complete, perfect, and good. From the standpoint of the life within you, anything, anything that denies this is false. We speak our words, our affirmations, and we, we believe that we're putting power into them, but actually we are drawing power from them. And it's not that we are doing it as isolated individuals with wishful thinking. It is actually the word of supreme power within all of us. It is not some bit of mightiness, but all mightiness. You know, what we like to say here is that God isn't all powerful, but God is all power. God isn't all just love, God is, God is love. And it is not this, this white guy sitting up in the clouds with a list and a hit you over the head stick, keeping track of everything, who's capricious and moody and has fallen off his anger meds. That's not the God we're talking about. We're talking about God as presence. God as presence not personality, God as presence. Whether you refer to God as he, she, it, or Fred, it doesn't matter. It's just that we want to reference our lives and inform them according to the knowledge that we are divine beings. In fact, we are spiritual beings living in a spiritual universe governed by spiritual laws. Beat that with a stick. <laughs> we are spiritual beings living in a spiritual universe governed by spiritual laws. Same thing as gravity. You know, gravity isn't selective. It doesn't say, you know, I'd really like to help you out today, Sam, but you drop that pencil and it's just going to fly away. It doesn't work that way. Gravity works the same for everybody. Electricity isn't moody or capricious. You can plug a lamp into an outlet or you can plug a fork in. Electricity doesn't care. It's going to do what electricity does. It's the same thing with spiritual law. It's law. Isn't that amazing? So when we wake up and we are conscious of this spiritual law, we actually get to be proactive in how we approach it, how we listen to the, the urgings and the nuances and the guidings, the guidances of all of this. You know, once we say yes to that divine yes, the world begins to become, as Einstein would have us believe, a friendly place. It becomes a friendly place. It doesn't become a place of evil. Now, the shock of what happened to the world 20 years ago, not just this country, is um, it's profound. It's profound. But what's really, for my own experience on this, and I know that you all have probably had that moment of what was I doing, where was I? And if you haven't had that, I think it's really important to talk about it and work it through because we, this is a teaching of acknowledgement, not burying. So we don't bury our stuff. We, we shine a light on it so that it can bless us. And then we can release it and move into whatever that greater good might be for us. So when 20 years ago, when that happened, we had that two days before, and I was a newly licensed practitioner, we had about an eight hour retreat in Encino. Do you remember the, the meditation center? And it was all of the practitioners. It was a mandatory thing. And we spent the day blessing each other. We spent the day in contemplation. We spent the day in a practice of love, of forgiveness, of understanding, of just simply being present, being mindful to the life within us and around us. And it was such an amazing thing. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who left that experience feeling so, so aware of the oneness and also my calling 
as a practitioner, which was to, and still remains as a minister, to not react from fear, anger, and visceral response, but to actually respond in wisdom. Allow for that reaction, but move into the greater truth, the respond ability that I have. So 48 hours later, the world changed. Now this community, I know that some of you were here then. Um, this, we came together immediately. We opened the doors of the sanctuary. The, um, the practitioner team immediately came together to see what we could do, who we could help. And we had a service that Wednesday. And I remember, because I did the music for it, I sang, we can be kind. Because it is the kindness that we show ourselves and others that is that seed that we begin to plant that will allow us to move from now what into what now? What now? What is that? What is the blessing? What is the divine gift that wants to seek to come forth? You know, when we see these things happen in the world, when they happen to us or to members in our family, part of why we, and you'll hear Dr. Mark and Reverend Mark all the time talk about how vital it is to have a regular disciplined spiritual practice. Now, when I was teaching principal in Portland, Oregon, all of my students knew that I would be going RDSP, RDSP, like a broken record, regular discipline, spiritual practice. And I would ask them, especially if they were my students, and they'd signed up to, for me to harass them about this. <laughs> and then come to me and say, well, this went wrong and this went. I said, well, how's your spiritual practice? What are you doing? Okay. Not out of shame or guilt, but just to begin to inter interrogate for us personally to interrogate how our connection with spirit is, how our connection as spirit is. So I remember a lot of polarities about that day. Our son was in preschool, and we didn't know how to take in all of the stuff that was happening and still hold this precious, happy, innocent kid in protective innocence, because we really wanted to have we wanted him to have this sense of safety and, and, and moving in within his own world and our world as knowing that he, that there's something radically right with him. We reached out to neighbors with caring hugs, offers of food, and we cried a lot. There were no planes for several days. I'm sure we all remember that. It was very quiet. And I remember one of my girlfriends and I took our kids to the beach in Santa Monica about four days in and just marveled at how precious everybody was treating each other, total strangers. And it was, it was such a, a, an interesting time. And so many people in the world reacted, and we watched this because we saw it on the news and we heard all of the pundits talking about it. And I'm, and I'm not in any way neglecting or denying the significance of all of that. However, however, I recognize that my path was to walk through my very own human, normal reactions. Again, shock, anger, pain, rage, fear, and to keep going without being defined by them. This is why spiritual practice is so important. It is so important. When we know we are not defined by the stuff that happens to us or in the world or the people around us that we love, then we have the ability to respond from consciousness. We have the ability to respond from wholeness, from radical rightness, right? From, the, from knowing that we are radically God. We are radically spirit. And when we know ourselves as that, the other thing that comes into it is we recognize that this infinite universe holds nothing back. It holds nothing back. It holds nothing back from any of us. However, as Ernest Holmes would say, ignorance of the law excuses no one from its effects. So if we believe and think that this world is limited and that there are enemies and that nothing is going to go right for us, that will be our experience because it will reflect out here. You know, Jesus said it is done unto you as you believe. It is done unto you as you believe. And that those are powerful words. Whether you follow Jesus or, or Oprah or Buddha or Lao Tzu, it doesn't matter, but those are powerful words because that is, it's more than just a, an Omi word for karma, it's that this is the truth. The world will respond 
according to that which we believe about it. Because we have these filters. So the way I like to put it is, are we going to be defined by the world or divined by God? And again, not this God up here, the personality God that you might have grown up with. You're fired. Get a new one. We don't need that one. When we are divined by the truth within, we get to honor our feelings and our anger and our rage and move through it knowing that there's something greater that divines us. That divines us. It's safe to have those feelings. And thank God, because those are sacred. Those are sacred because they are the opening to understanding, to wisdom, to compassion, which, have you noticed, this world could use, that's God calling right now. There's <laughs> compassion that we really, really need to cultivate with ourselves. So, a friend of mine, Dr. David Alexander, is a senior minister of the Atlanta Center for Spiritual Living. And so in his blog yesterday, he wrote some really, really powerful words. And I stay away. I don't watch the news very often. I mean, I'm aware of what happens in the world, but I don't need the opinion. Um, and even the word fact, I have, I talked about this on Wednesday. I think I did. Maybe I didn't. It doesn't. You'll hear. I'm going to be in your heads. I promise. But I have an anagram for the word fact, F-A-C-T. Fact, because facts change. Fluid assessment of a current trend, okay? Fluid assessment of a current trend. So you will hear people, newscasters, leaders, whatever, they will say, this is a fact, this is a fact. And you're going to say, I, you know what? It was a fact that the world was flat. Guess what? It changed. It was a fact that the population of such and such country was, but it changed. So facts change. So anyway, David Alexander is someone who offers a spiritual approach, as I do, and I, I've, known, I've known him for a long time. And he wrote of his own need to connect that day. He was working in an office in St. Louis, and he had to leave because it was just so powerful and so profound. He found a Catholic church where people were streaming in, holding each other and crying and expressing their shock, all of it. He went inside, and he wrote that he doesn't remember much of what was said or done in that service, but something one of the priests said has logged in his brain, and it informed his own journey of social and spiritual activism. And this really resonated for me, too. As we come together in grief, let us remember that God works through broken hearts. Let us remember that God works for, through broken hearts. And I immediately thought of Rumi and Leonard Cohen, both, who said the same thing, which is the cracks are where the light gets in. That's how the light gets in. You know, we, we might try to be really, really solid and stiff and tough. No light gets in. But it's when we allow ourselves to break open, as Brene Brown would talk about. When we break open, the light comes in. The possibility comes in. Because now we're vulnerable to God. We're available to God. We're available to love. We are vulnerable to possibility, to guidance, to inspiration. And that's... I have to speak for myself. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. I want to be vulnerable to God. So this is what else he wrote about that. 9-11 was not only the end of our innocence as a nation, it was also the beginning of our vulnerability. It was, as all trauma is, the end of our separation and isolationist thinking and the beginning of a long journey home to one humanity. Yes, God works through broken hearts. When we are broken open by life's experiences, we are made available to a deeper and more authentic connection to our source. That's the power of vulnerability. It looks like weakness because it involves the removing of our layers of protection and safety. But the truth is, we were never separate from each other to begin with. Therefore, life will always seek to reunite us to the power of our oneness. The pain we feel in awakening to our oneness is often dictated by the attachment we have to a consciousness of separation. Breathe that in for a moment. The pain we feel in awakening to our oneness is often dictated, I'd say, of informed by the attachment we have to a consciousness of separation. And this world thrives with that idea of separation. It thrives with the idea that there isn't enough, that you're not good enough, that 
that, that my muffins are bad. Whatever it is, that's how this world, you know, it's just, we have to start interrogating those narratives that we've been telling ourselves about who is right, who is wrong, what's good, what's bad. Because the truth is, it's all God. It's all an expression of the one mind, the one life. Just that we get to interpret how we're going to share that, how we're going to express it to each other and to ourselves. So if we aren't willing to move beyond those attachments, and how that looks is, um, well, the need to be right. You know, you've often heard, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And of course, the, the, the response everybody comes up with is, well, if I'm right, I will be happy. Um, I hear that from my son. <laughs> I think it's, I think when you're 22, you're supposed to have that response, right? When you're 18, when you're 14, that's the response you're supposed to have. But we're big now. So let's move into a place of recognizing that there's a greater thing than just soothing and supporting our egos in being right and being an authority on something. Be, be willing to be wrong so that you can move into a place of happiness and peace. It might seem to be that we have justified or emotional, sorry, justified spiritual or emotional pain in, our, in being wrong or someone else being right. But pain is pain. It's a sacred gift from God, believe it or not. It calls for relief. Pain is calling for something. It's calling for greater love. Pain is a sign that we need more love. Pain is a sign we need more life. Pain is a sign we need more truth. Pain is a sign that we need to be recognizing our radical rightness and our wholeness. Pain is a call to prayer. Pain is a call to love. This world is in pain. What can we do? We can hear it as a call to love. It is a hear it as a call to prayer. And it starts with each of us individually individually, and we have to move to a level of solution. You know, Einstein said that you do not solve a problem at the level of that problem. You have to move into the consciousness of the possibility of solution. You have to move up. You have to rise up. You have to rise up to the possibility of solution. And Dr. Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So I am going to initiate all of you into being spiritual first responders. We've been honoring our first responders, and God bless them. So glad, so glad that they are there. And let's be spiritual first responders. A spiritual first responder chooses to stand in the integrity of God's wholeness and fundamental peace, rather than collapsing into irony, bitterness, and cynicism. Yes? yes. OK. A spiritual first responder remembers that the light defines the darkness, not the other way around. And most importantly, a spiritual first responder is willing to hear everything in life as a call for love, no matter how thickly veiled the appearance is. So here's the first practice. It's an individual one. Um, we have a dog and we have a cat. And it's amazing how when you have a pet, or a baby. You soften so much. And, and my dog, you'll all meet her, she'll be a church dog. Bella thinks she's um, a blanket because she'll get on your lap and just cover you. She's a border collie, apparently with no spine, because she just goes like this. <laughs> and, you know, everybody who meets her goes, who's a good girl? Who's a good dog? Who's a good girl? Who's a, who's a sweet puppy? And I do it too. Who's my sweet puppy? We don't do that to ourselves. And we certainly don't do it to each other. Can you imagine if you, if you got up this morning and, and you saw Sam and you said, who's a good Sam? Who's a good piano player? Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Or you said that in the mirror. Who's a good girl? Who's a good muffin? Who's, who's? So we're going to practice. I just want you to turn to each other, whether you know them or not, and to say, who's a good human? Who's a good person? Come on now. Who's a good girl? Who's a good boy? This is what God feels like. This is what God feels like. Even when you're in traffic and somebody cuts you off, what if you could imagine that person has a sweet little puppy? Who's a good puppy? You can't drive. Who's a good puppy? What are you doing behind the wheel? Who's a good puppy? 
it takes practice. It does. Because as I said, I stood there this morning. Who's a good girl? Who needs to lose 15 pounds by 10 o'clock? <sighs> the guidance in the journey that we get from listening to that presence within takes practice. It takes practice. And the practice, you know, don't, don't think of it as, oh my God, I've got something else to learn. No. Move it into that place of your heart. That, who's a good girl? Who's a good boy? Place of your heart. Who's a good minister? <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Who's a good singer? Who's a good girl? Go to that place. Start with that. Because when we can open our hearts, if there's some tenderness there, then we're able to access what Ernest Holmes called the inexhaustible reservoir of life, of imagination, energy, and will. And it flows through us into action. Because now we're open. And it feels a lot better, doesn't it? It just feels so much better. So begin today to change the narrative that if you're telling yourself the world isn't friendly, that there is no hope, or that we have to be warring with people all the time, change that. Interrogate that. Who said so? Do I have to believe it? No. Can I change my thinking? Yeah. You're in charge. You're in charge. Ernest Holmes also said, God never compromises. And good never compromises with its opposite. Truth knows no opposites. When we take away the belief in evil, the belief that the outward appearance is the same as the inner reality, evil flees. So today, I want to encourage you and invite you to create a new narrative about 9-11, about anything that is calling for more love and more peace. Today is the day that you and I choose to know that nothing has more power or influence than love. Transform your now what's into what now, God? What now, spirit? What's calling for love this day? I got this from uh, Michael Beckwith a while ago. I can choose to let my story define me confine me, refine me, or outshine me. Or I can choose to move on and leave it behind me. So bless those flags. Bless those people. Certainly bless our leaders and this country. And by the way, if you do nothing else this day, would you please, please, please absolutely bless the Republic of Pi? Thank you. Thank you. So in that joy and in that presence, let's pray. Honoring the breath, honoring the love, honoring the presence that God is as each of us, that spirit is as each of us. We celebrate the truth that we know that there is one power and one presence. It is God, it is spirit, it is perfect, it is whole, and it is fully, fully, fully surrounding and filling each one of us right here and right now. So the truth is that the most true thing about each of us is God, is spirit, is possibility, is wholeness. And from that knowing, from that recognition, we choose this day to move into a greater way of thinking. We choose to be available to God. We choose to be vulnerable the possibility, knowing that vulnerability means that we are willing to love. And how glorious it is to know that. How wonderful it is to know that there is something radically right about each of us, that there's a lot radically right about each of us, that there's a lot radically right about this world, and we choose to know it, to be it, to see it, and to live as that right here and right now. So we bless this church. We bless all churches. Cathedrals, ashrams, temples, mosques, all paths to God. We bless all of them knowing that God celebrates through us. We are that temple. And each of us, as we come together in consciousness, we know that right where we are, God is and all is well. So I know that this is a prayer of love and healing for this nation, for this world, for we choose to live in a recognition of that fundamental wholeness. And as we move out into the world this day, we carry the light. 
We are that light. We remember who's a good God. And we see it in, his, in each other and in ourselves. We speak it in all that we do, all that we see and all that we know. And we choose gratitude. We live in such a, oh, a pool of saturation of gratitude. Because we know it is already so. So we release this word into God's perfect law, knowing it is done. And how wonderful to know it is so. And so it is. And together we say, Amen. Thank you. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful for all that I have. I am so So this is time for affirmative giving. Let's hold our gifts to our hearts as we say together. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. God said, wow, wow, wow. You're a light God mummy. What a good mummy. Peace. 
disrespectful people, oh, entitled people, angry people, lying people. Forgive me when I'm one of those people, people deliver. Nina Whitaker, ah, oh, goddess of music. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you can get Nita's uh, music at her website, nitawhitaker.com. Um, I just have to do this. I'm going to put my mask back on. Would, would you come up here, Nita, just for a moment? And Sydney, Rip Sydney. Oh, did did we get the memo, get the memo or what? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you know, <laughs> it's in the genes. I can't, what can I tell you? <laughs> and let's show some love and appreciation for our awesome Sam and Bob today. Okay, so I have a few announcements. First of all, uh, as far as donations go, for those of you who are here in the sanctuary, as you exit the sanctuary, there's some boxes in the foyer where you can drop off those donations. Uh, to those of you watching us virtually, uh, so you probably know the drill, but I'll just go through it. You can call the church office, 818-762-7566. We'll be here for about 30 minutes after service to take your donation via credit or debit card over the phone. You can go to our website, nhcrs.org forward slash give, and that takes you straight to our donation page where you can make a one-time or set up recurring donations, or you can text the word give to area code 818-457-3419. And uh, for those of you who also want to be able to support us through when you're shopping on Amazon, if you join Amazon Smile, uh, we are listed as Church of Religious Science North Hollywood, but if you designate us as a place to make donations, every time you make a purchase, we get a donation. It's free to you, so we'd love you to consider doing that. And thank you so much, always, from the bottom of our hearts for all the ways that you continue to support us. I'm just so grateful through all this time that we can continue to gather this way and online and have these amazing, amazing people <laughs> supporting us. Prayer with a Practitioner is available via Zoom after the service, so if you're on Facebook Live, just go to our website and get onto Zoom and we can put you in a one-on-one -on -one breakout session with a practitioner. Those of you in the sanctuary, if you would like prayer with a practitioner, just come forward, forward after the service and uh, one of our practitioners will pray with you. You can also email your prayer requests to prayer at nhcrs.org, um, or you can put prayer requests as you're leaving uh, the sanctuary today in our prayer request box. And uh, another way, see, we love to keep you connected with prayer. You can call the church office, and option four on our menu allows you to leave a voicemail message of whatever uh, prayer request you may have and we check those emails and um, voicemails every evening and send those out to our practitioners. Wednesday evening service with Reverend Sydney again. This Wednesday, uh, the 15th, our meditation before service starts at 6.50. The service itself starts at 7 p.m. It's gonna be live and Facebook and uh, Zoom as well. And Reverend Sydney's topic this week is atonement, forgiveness, and a really nice brisket. <laughs> the honoring of Yom Kippur holds possibilities for all of us. We own our stuff, we agree to fast from denying our divine nature, and we let the filters of fear and anger dissolve. How clearly we begin to see and how joyfully we start to live when we become willing to love. And the brisket? Well, that's just common sense, <laughs> delicious. <laughs> so I'll be joining Reverend Sydney for that service. 
Our grief support group uh, meets today that's facilitated by our wonderful practitioner, Carol Winokur, and they meet on Zoom at 1 p.m. This could be for loss of a loved one, uh, just loss of something in your life that's causing grief. I know people, as they're reliving what happened 20 years ago, are feeling grief. Anything uh, like that, uh, you're welcome to join the grief support group, and Carol really is a master at leading that. Living a Course in Miracles, another master practitioner uh, that's led by our practitioner, Jeannie Laporte, that meets this coming Thursday, the 15th, from 7.15 to 9.15 p.m. Um, did I get that date right? That's the 16th, sorry. <laughs> uh, our youth church is open uh, for youth of all ages. I mean, that includes us, right, because we're all young at heart. But all, all our youngsters who haven't been able to gather up until now up in the youth church are welcome uh, at the 9.45 a.m. service. Rising Strong Workshop with Reverend Sidney will be held on September 25th. That's a Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's going to be in person only. Uh, it's inspired by Brene Brown's book, Rising Strong. And Reverend Sidney's workshop will be a practical and spirit-led experience to lovingly explore the stories we tell ourselves about why we can or can't, are or aren't. So if you want to change your thinking, consider joining that uh, class. The cost is $30. Also, we'll begin the Essential Ernest Holmes class, which will also be taught by Reverend Sidney. That's uh, starting 10 Tuesdays, beginning September 28th, and that'll be taught from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m., both in person and on Zoom. Students gain a holistic awareness of Ernest, uh, that's Ernest Holmes, our founder, his thoughts, and come to see that many of their questions about applying the science of mind were, uh, to daily life were addressed by our founder himself at one time or another. So the cost for that one is 245 if paid in full, 270 if paid in two installments of 135. And this is a prerequisite for anyone interested in practitioner training. And we're inviting you to join in the fun of uh, being one of those who helps to host on Facebook Live. If that calls to you at all, it's really relatively easy and a lot of fun. So if you're interested, please call the church office. And just a reminder for those of you out there in the Zoom virtual world that uh, we continue to have our Zoom virtual patio before and after service. Um, and so you can still connect with congregants in that way. Uh, Zoom meditation, we continue to hold that Monday through Saturday from 8 to 8.15. And for any more information about anything going on here at the church, just go to our website, nhcrs.org where you can also sign up for our weekly e-blasts and monthly newsletters. And with that, let's rise and let's join in the peace song.
I'm at home in the heart of God. I'm at home in the heart of God. My life is anchored in truth. My life is anchored in truth. I can never be separate. I can never be separate. I live in the consciousness of peace. I live in the consciousness of peace. I release all fear. I release all fear. I am living love. I am living love. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us, everyone. <laughs>